my name is Amy, I'm from Attic Cameras Marketing Team and I'm here with, today with Steve Chambers, our CEO, and we're here to explore and compare the differences between CMOS and CCD sensors. Um, we've had some excellent questions in from you guys on social media, and um, I'd like to kick it off with the first question, which is, um, why is there so much amp glow with CMOS sensors? Okay, so, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, and we compare that with CCDs. So CCDs tend to have very few other circuits on the piece of silicon together with the image array. So there was, in that case, just the amplifier, especially a few transistors. So on CCD, what got known as amp glow was very easy to control and generally was you know, below the level at which it was normally detectable. Uh, so when we look at CMOS sensors, these glows would get around the outside of the sensor itself. Uh, quite often gets called amp glow. It's, it's, m there's many, many more circuits on a CMOS sensor and they're running a lot higher speed. So it's all of that circuitry and some of it heats up. And as it heats up, it heats up some of the image array. And as the image array heats up, it gets higher levels of uh, thermal current. Uh, then you've also got uh, the potential because there's a lots of transistors switching on and off really, really quickly. Uh, and if that happens, occasionally you get this com this phenomenon known as uh, impact ionisation, and that actually liberates a real photon. So some of this glow is not actually thermal in nature; it's actually a real photon getting on top of the image array and generating an electron that way. So yeah, CMOS there's so many more circuits on the sensor than there is on the CCD. Well, with that in mind, can it be mitigated at all? Yeah, so the only, well, as, as camera designers, it's really down to us to shut down all of the circuits that are not needed on a render sensor, around a CMOS sensor, when it's integrated. And we do that, and some sensors lend, that, lend themselves to this process better than others. So typically, the uh, things like the Horizon and the Panasonic, we can shut down most of those circuits and you end up with really quite low levels of glow around the edges of a sensor. Some of the Sony IMXs, it's very difficult to shut down as many of those circuits as you would do with this Panasonic sensor. So, so camera designers have a role in mitigating and then as a user, as a, an imager, then what you're left with is uh, using dark uh, dark frames and then if you're subtracting dark frames they can be pretty successful at removing the these glows mm. but what you are left with is added levels of noise within the region of the camera with the within the region of the image which have the glow so you still have added levels of noise within those regions yes. okay is it dependent on temperature okay so it's again with Dark current is typically dependent upon temperature and it halves roughly every seven or eight degrees you can cool a sensor. Mm. Uh, there's elements of these glows within CMOS that respond well to temperature and elements that don't. So anything that's due to impact ionisation really doesn't vary a huge amount with uh, temperature. Then some of these, these glows that we're seeing is actually due to local heating of the dye itself. So there again, because the heat is generated within the sensors, it can either, elements of that respond well and elements respond less well. It all goes a bit non-linear with temperature. So you have to select a temperature which do your dark frames mm -hmm. and stick to it. Uh, and it may be that the old technique we used to use with CCD where you could scale a dark frame doesn't really apply as well within CMOS. Right, okay. Um, can CMOS sensors be engineered to reduce amp glow at all? Yes, they certainly can be, and some perform better than others. Right. And it really depends, I think, really on what the, what the designers had in mind for the sensor. So again, if we go back to Panasonic sensor in the horizon, that was a chip that was intended for digital SLR cameras, which sometimes needed to take long exposure pictures. And so there was downloads built into those sensors that allow a shutdown of much more of the circuitry. Cameras intended for machine vision are probably much more, or sensors intended for machine vision, 
I'm much more focused on checking out maybe you know, hundreds of friends per second. Uh, and so long exposures is not really on that design document when they were making the sensors. So yes, um, some aspects of design can impact on the amounts of glows we get. Okay. Um, how can sensor gain be best exploited given that it usually has a low dynamic? Yes. Uh, I think something we're saying there is that as you increase the gain, the dynamic range starts to decrease with mm -hmm. a, a uh, CMOS sensor. So how can you better use this? So there are some types of imaging that really need high dynamic range. Mm -hmm. So there we will look at broadband, LRGB imaging, where you have very, very bright stars and then you still need dark backgrounds as well. So it gives a very large dynamic range, which responds best to low gains and making the most of any dynamic range. Uh, then what would respond well to low dynamic range situations? Well, that really is narrowband imaging. So with narrowband, you don't true you don't get true star colours. So it doesn't really matter largely what happens to the stars if they all saturate. And then we can make the very best out of the very low root noise of those sensors uh, when used at high gains because it's very much a read noise limited technique narrowband imaging. Okay. Um, what is the real difference in performance between the twelve bit? Um, CMOS and the 16-bit? Yes, what's the difference in performance? <coughs> that is a, a really tough question to answer in many ways and <laughs> can get quite technical quite quickly. So, uh, I guess I've got this one. Really what you want is for the analog to digital converter not to be limiting within a camera design. Uh, within the CCD range, we tend to choose 16-bit analog digital converters because we know none of our cameras have 16 bits of dynamic range. They tend to, the CCD is tend to have around 14 bits. Uh, and that means that the ADC yeah, it isn't the limiting factor in how much dynamic range we have. With CMOS, the full dynamic range of some of those chips, things like the Panasonic again as an example, could probably be described in 13 bits or maybe even 14 bits. But we're using a 12-bit ADC to digitize that range. Uh, so obviously we get a completely acceptable picture from the sensor itself, and it looks like a picture. It's, it's not got any obvious defects on it. But what we're doing there is we're digitizing effectively the noise level much less accurately and I think that can have an impact when we come to average frames so it might be that uh, CCDs <coughs> the types of images with digitizing 16 bits allows us to gain more data a more dynamic range by averaging a large number of those pictures whereas with the 12 volt 12 bit CMOS we're already losing some data every time we digitise because we're not really digitising with the enough resolution anyway. Uh, I'm sure we could speak much more about that one, but briefly, yeah, just briefly, in terms of impact, it's probably not a huge impact, but theoretically at least, a CCD images should respond better on stacking. Okay, um, what's the difference in well depth uh, taking into account uh, manual settings in CMOS? Yeah, uh, again that impacts on this, this previous question. Actually we did a, a video uh, about a year ago, maybe 18 months ago on this, so maybe it's worthwhile just if we put it on YouTube, we can yes. just pop, it, pop the link on. Uh, otherwise, so what's the difference in, so as you increase the gain, you decrease the apparent full well depth. So, and you, it's not just you don't actually decrease the number of electrons that you can collect in a pixel, but you decrease the number of electrons you can measure in a pixel. Oh. Uh, and it's a bit like uh, with a hi fi, maybe, or you know, a, a music uh, system, where the gain you can think of like the volume knob. 
So at some point here on the range, you are the loudest parts of a song will be as loud as the speakers will be able to go. You can still turn the volume up further. The thing that the music will never be any louder than it was, but you'll find that you'll have distortion uh, on the on the louder parts. And in the case of CCDs, it's not distorted, it ends up saturating, so you just end up losing the ability to digitize. Okay. Um, and lastly, what's the difference between the Hyperion and performance between the two? Yes, again, this is <coughs> quite hard to just encapsulate and say you know, one is better than the other, one is different to the other. Narrowband imaging is very much a, a signal to noise and a read noise limited technique. So the backgrounds can be really very, very dark mm. and very, very low photons per pixel per second in the narrowband image. Uh, and that really plays to CMOS's strengths when you come to looking at very, very low read noise. So if you have yeah, potentially a sensor with a very small dynamic range, but with one, one or two electrons worth of read noise, uh, that has potential to be more sensitive than a CCD with three or four electrons read noise. And again, there is some added complexity here <coughs> that we might find that the smoother backgrounds and the more quality coming through when you average a CCD image kind of plays the CCD strengths. But then again, you've got the quicker readout of CMOS, meaning if you're taking shorter images, your, the downtime and the read cycle is shorter for a CMOS sensor. So both are really quite good at doing narrowband imaging. So if you're using narrowband imaging for C, with CMOS, it's probably erring on the side of quite a lot of gain in order to really emphasise the read noise. Yeah. Okay, that's it from us, I think. Um, I hope that's covered quite a lot of your questions there. Um, however, if you do, do have any more questions, please don't hesitate to contact our Lovely Hate team um, via email or any other our social media platforms. If you enjoyed this video today, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, thanks very much. Bye-bye.